All right, so we were doing equations last week. We're going to do some more stuff with equations, like the next few chapters are based on equations. What are we in math 207? We're doing 8.1, 8.2 today, and maybe I just randomly throw a, a dot in there. That's too bright. Whoop. Oh. Yeah, the chapter eight is not too bad. Uh, chapter eight, we're doing it, it's, it, we're doing sections eight point one, which is on formulas, eight point two, which is on proportions. And I realized that the homework due dates were askew, and so I fixed them. Fixed them all. Uh, why you got that? This, you're making no fucking sense. Look on your face. I'm not speaking Spanish. No, it's because I did a homework for chapter eight. And okay. I thought it was way more easier because I seen the example. And the okay. Well, just yeah. Chapter eight is really just an extension of chapter seven. It's it's yeah. doing the same shit. It's just chapter eight. We're looking at formulas, so specific formulas. In the set past section, I was giving you. We just came up with x's and y's, and we're solving. The solving is done the same way with this, but for formulas. We've got different formulas we can look at. Like one of the formulas we talked about in the past was total resistance. And total resistance is for two, two resistors in series. No, in parallel. It's R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2. So what we're doing in this section is just using formulas that apply to specific scenarios. This is a scenario that's related to electricity. So this is electricity. What we wanna do with formulas is, if it's not listed, write down the formula. Make sure you have it written down so you know what you're working with. A lot of even top students skip this step and try to do the next step and sometimes fuck it up. Then we are going to substitute or replace the variables with any known values. We will then solve for the remaining variable, There should usually only be one left. But sometimes there's more than one, and we'll talk about that, I believe, in later chapters. It's definitely not anytime soon. <clears throat> and finally, really importantly, interpret the results in the context of the problem. This was probably a more important this step, really, than it is for other classes I've taught, because usually they go on and they eventually learn to do this on, on in other classes, but you guys are doing this for trade skills for a purpose. And if you can't like take the results and go, what the hell did I do this for? And apply it to whatever you were just, why you were trying to solve it, it means not. So you always gotta link it back to what you were trying to find out. So we're going to do this here with the resistance problem. Find the total resistance. If 
R1 equals 10 ohms and R2 equals 6 ohms. Got to bring that equation back down. So this is kind of like having a circuit that's doing this. And there's 10 ohms across this resistor, six ohms across this resistor. And we're trying to find like what the total resistance is between A and B. That's what that, you know, electricity, if you were doing this problem, that's what you'd be doing right here. A circuit board or breadboard or whatever you're working on. Well, our formula was the total resistance RT is R1 times R2 over R1 plus R2. And I have some of those values now. I have R1 and R2. So everywhere I see R1, I'm going to plug in 10. And everywhere I see R2, I'm going to plug in 6. I'm going to use parentheses, because that way I avoid making the mistake of thinking they're numbers that don't multiply if they should. So we're doing the good old order of operations. We multiply the stuff on top first. 10 times 6 is 60. The bottom is 10 plus 6, which is 16. We throw that in a calculator. What do we get? 3.75 or something like that? Yeah. Is that what it is? Let's see the units we had. I had ohms times ohms over ohms plus ohms, which is ohms squared over ohms, which is just ohms. So 3.75 ohms. Interpreting it into the context of the problem, the total resistance from A to B is 3.75 ohms on off screen. Is ready for more? Yeah. All right, so the next one is going to take into the account a couple more equations we work with for a rectangle. The area is length times width. We usually say A equals L times W. Perimeter. It comes in two forms. 
you'll see 2L plus 2W. The parameter usually goes by P. Or you might see it with the two factored out, two times L plus W. <coughs> So for this class, when you take the test, any equation you're going to need will be given to you. I'm not expecting you to memorize all formulas uh, for every possible trade that's out there. You, when you, whatever trade you're going for, you'll, you'll be taught the formulas that you need to know there. But working with them is all the same. So let's do a problem with this. <clears throat> if the perimeter of a rectangle is 12 feet, And the width is four feet. Find the area of the rectangle. Are you texting her jokes? Because she's about to be out here giggling. What the hell are you doing? All right. So we want to find, let's uh, make sure we go through, go through and like label what we know. Uh, it says the perimeter is 12 feet. And they tell us it's a rectangle. I'm going to put P equals 12 feet. And it tells me that the width is 4 feet. So W equals 4 feet. What I want to find is the area. Find A. And A is length times width. And I have part of that right now. I have the four, but I don't have the L yet. So it looks like I need to find L first. Find the length first. And they did give us information about the perimeter with the perimeter being two L plus two W. For some of those, we know the value. We know the perimeter is 12 feet. And the width, I've got a two times it, four feet. It looks like my units here are in feet. I'm just going to make a note of it over here and not work with it on the later steps. So if I take this, if I clean this up, I've got to do what we were doing in chapter seven, solve. So I'm going to take that, clean that up a little bit. I got two times L plus two times four is eight. I'll subtract the eight from both sides because I'm trying to get L by itself so I can find out what L's value is. 12 minus eight is four, and I have two L. Try to isolate L, I divide by two, and I get two equals L. What does this mean in terms of the context of the problem? The length of the rectangle is two feet. Okay. 
And that's my tell. <laughs> Which means I can go on and solve my area part now. Area is length times width. And I have both of these values. I have two feet and four feet. We multiply that out, I get two times four is eight, and feet times feet is feet squared. And another way of writing that is eight square feet. The area of the rectangle is eight square feet. <laughs> My allergies flared up really, really bad this weekend. I thought I had a cold on Friday, Thursday and Friday. I had a cold, and then Friday afternoon. It just turned into sneezing after sneeze after fucking sneeze after sneeze. I'm like, I have never had a cold where I sneeze. Yeah, yeah, I started taking allergy pills on Friday night. Yeah, yeah I'm talking drowsy right now. I'm normally here by three o'clock. I got here like 3 45 today because I'm like, nope, stuck in drowsy. What? I'm not gonna pass out. I'm not that tired where I'm gonna fall asleep in your lecture. I'm quite confident in that. You're not that boring. If, I, if I'm lecturing somebody and it's that boring, I might fall asleep, but you're not gonna make it that boring. Every once in a while, you start laughing about something that only you fucking know. You're listening to the fucking voices in your head. Well, damn. Got jokes. All right, let's have. Uh, uh, we had this problem last week. Uh, I equals PRT, simple interest. Let's find the. Uh, ooh. Find the starting principle and ending amount. final amount with your hands in the air if you're a true player someone wave your hands it's in the center of the room there you go find the starting principle and final amount if the interest is 94 dollars and 50 cents the interest rate is 21%. And the time was for half a year. So let's label what we got. I have got, it's giving me interest, which is my I. Interest is $94.50. R is 21%. We want to write it as a decimal. 21% as a decimal is 0 0.21. 
and t is time in years. Time in years is one half, uh, so 0 0.5 as a decimal. We started with I equals PRT. Let's fill in the values we know. I got $94.50 on the right. We got P times 0 0.21. And T is 0 0.5. We want to clean up that left side or the right side. You can guess step multiplied together. 0 0.21 times 0 0.5 should be 0 0.105, but I'm just going to verify it on the calculator. No point in rushing it. And if I want to get P by itself, I got to divide both sides by that. I'm getting 900. Hmm? No, never. We're not. We're not converting back to a percentage. We're just leaving it as the, as the dollar amount. So the dollar amount is the starting principle is nine hundred dollars. So that's what they started with. which is a lot of interest uh, for half a year, but you're not gonna find 21% interest anywhere you go. Now I asked what the final amount is. What, how can I figure out what the final amount is? The final amount is what you started with, your starting principle. plus any interest you made. Or A equals P plus I. So I had P was, we just calculated, that was $900. And interest was given to us already at $94.50. So my A here is different than in the rectangle problem where it was area, here it's amount. The final amount here is 900 plus 9450 is $994.50.
I'm going to enter this information in Excel and show you how to do some of this in Excel. Because um, at some point, you may have you be using a computer with whatever career you have, and the computer will do all the multiplication for you if you know what to put in. Wait for it. Up it, area. So I got a sheet up here. I'm going to just label some fields. I'm going to call this interest. I'll call this uh, rate, time, principal is one of the things we counted, calculated, and amount, final amount. to help my visually challenged. All right, so the interest, I'm just gonna put in the values we were given. 94.50 was the interest. The rate was 0.21, time was 0 0.5. For, what? It, del it deletes it, it's, when there's no zero, it takes it off on its own. Uh, so that's one thing I can show you. If you want to see them, let me let me zoom back out. Ah! Why is it not zooming out? There we go. There's a keyboard for it. That only zoomed up. Why is it doing that? Am I hit the wrong key. What the fuck is happening here? What happened with your press state? Okay, try this again. Copy that real quick. Make a new Excel sheet. And this one zoomed in way too fucking big too. See, Carl. There we go. And now I'll zoom these in. Okay. Uh, so one thing, if you want to make sure they all have two decimals and you have the entire row here, uh, you can increase or decrease decimals. So I can take the decimals away and notice it does some rounding here. It just changed 94.50 to $95. Or I can take it up to two decimal places on all of them. And then you can add the dollar sign and also. Uh, dollar sign. Yeah, I don't want to do that because only one of those is a dollar sign. So principal. Uh, we had I equals P RT. If I wanted to find P, I could divide both sides by R and T. If I did that, I would have I divided by RT equals P.
I'll show this on paper in a second. I want to make this kind of, or, or another way of putting it is the P first. P equals I divided by RT. And so what I want to do is simulate this in Excel. What I'm trying to find here is my principal, which is my P. So in the box next to where I'm la labeled principal, I'm going to do everything else that's here. Equals I divided by RT. I'm going to hit the equal sign. And then I'm going to click on the cell that has interest in it. The interest is in that cell. I'll hit divided by. I'm going to put parentheses so that it knows R times T go together. I'm going to say click on the rate square. Put in asterisk for multiplication. And click on time. And then I'll end the parentheses. What I've done is I've effectively done interest, which is the blue one, B1, divided by rate times time. If I hit enter, it should give me 900. And it does. Final amount was principal plus interest. So I can do that here. I can say equals the principal square plus the interest square. So you're only, when you do it in Excel, you're really only doing one side of the equation. You have to have solved for the other side of the equation, got it down to one letter already. If I do that here, I get the 994.50. We'll look at that in a second again. Let's just write down what we're talking about. In Excel. To use formulas, you have to solve for a variable. Then when you are replacing the variables with the values, You have two options. You can A, click on a cell that has the value in it. Or B, type the value manually. This one is the worst way to go. And I'll show you why when I click back on the Excel screen. If, you, if you're using a spreadsheet, type in the values and squares and use it that way for a couple reasons. When I look at an equation here, I can't see where the 900 came from. Oh, let me, uh, let me do it. Let me do that 900 the real way, typing in part of the way with just typing in values. I'm going to do 94.50 divided by 0 0.21 times 0 0.5. This is all typing in all the values manually without using the cells. Now, if I want to see where it came from, I got to read fine print. And if I want to edit it, I got to edit it here. Sucks. Sometimes this really sucks because the formula is pretty big. On this one, it shows me where the values are. So if I want to go change something real quick, I can like, oh shit, it wasn't 21%. It was supposed to be 12. I can just go override it really quick and it updates it. Crazy, huh? So 
Excel can be really handy. It allows you to play around with some values. You're not being tested on this. This is more of a utility thing uh, for you. Uh, in sales, uh, markup, is the sale price minus the cost? What the fuck are you laughing at? Do I have like fucking something in my face? <laughs> Is that it? You entertained by a little gas? She might be. She might fucking love the shit out of that. <laughs> the fuck are you saying, Nate? Why is she giggling at me? You talking shit? F. She said I was right in front. <laughs> she said what? She said I was in the front. I'm, I'm at the smell. She said he said you said he was in the front with the smell. I don't know. Maybe I'm not young enough to appreciate this. <laughs> He's a little off. <laughs> All right. So in the last one, I told you we could solve for other letters. Uh, here, let's solve for S and then C. So I'll just start with the same equation for both of them, the same starting one. If I want to get S by itself, I want to solve for S, I want that bad boy to be alone. So just like when we would add numbers to other sides to get stuff alone, I can do that here. I'm going to treat C like it's a value, and I'm just going to add it to both sides. I get S equals M plus C. The sale price equals the cost plus the markup. Damn, Dave, I'm that boring. Back here, fucking asleep. Hey. Is your name Dave? Is that what uh, he's Isn't it David? Oh, he doesn't respond to Dave. As soon as I said David, his head popped right up. Am I boring? I know. And then enough to, okay. We'll make it more lively. All right, so if we wanted to solve for cost, maybe, maybe lively means being louder. If I want to solve for cost, on this one, I want to get C by itself. I have two approaches. Uh, I can, I hate doing divided by a negative sign. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add C to both sides. And I get C plus M equals S. And I'm still solving for C. So I can subtract M from both sides. And I get C equals S minus M. Sales minus the markup. Alternatively, You could have done it one other way. Let's do it the other way with that one, uh, just to show you both ways. 
normally if I'm solving for C, I would subtract S from both sides. We get M minus S equals negative C. And then C has got a negative sign on it. If I multiply by a negative one or divide by a negative one, it will change the sign. The right side becomes positive C. Here I have to distribute the negative sign to both of these. This becomes negative M minus a negative S is plus S. And so if I rewrite that, I get C equals S minus M, just like we had right above. All right, chapter eight, point two, portions. Portions are when we have two ratios that are equal to each other. Two ratios or fractions that are equal to each other. We don't want B to equal zero because then it makes the fraction of zero on bottom. We don't want D to equal zero. Something I'm sure you've all seen at least one point or other uh, is cross multiplying. I can take the B and multiply it by the C. I can take the D and multiply it by the A, and I get AD equals BC. A times D equals B times C. <laughs> so let's look at that in relation to some problems. I'm going to write through them. Uh, our first example. We will have x over 4 equals 9 over 6. In this context, again, we're solving for the variable. If I cross multiply here, I get 6x equals 9 times 4. Or what is nine times four? 36. So if I divide by six, we get x equals six. I'll give you guys one to try on real quick. This section is really short. There's not shit to do in this section.
Everyone doing? Would you guys get? You didn't do it, did you? What'd you get? That's correct. That's at least the first step. Then you want to solve for X, which means we got to clean up each side, don't we? I've got four times 20 is going to give me 80 X. Five times 17 is 85, I think. <clears throat> and if I divide both sides by 80, I get X equals 85 over 80. Which is 17 over 16. So X is 1.125. Is that what you get when you divide it? That might not be small enough. That's what that's not small enough. It's it's 1.06 to something. Maybe I should just do it. Not, not small enough. <clears throat> what do you think you did a subtraction, Liz? Uh, yeah, uh, it, depending on it, it'll tend, like the homework will tell you how to leave it. Uh, I'm okay with you leaving it as a fraction here. Let's do a couple more proportions. 8.2 is really short. It's really simple. This next one's a little bit pain in the ass. But the steps to solving it are the same. I'm going to put this step in parentheses and do that cross multiplying. And we'll get 5 times x minus 2 equals 3 times x plus 8. <clears throat> if I distribute here, I have 5 times x plus five times negative two, five times negative two is negative 10. Here I distribute the three to the X, I get three X. And three times eight is plus 24, yeah. Now I can choose to move the X's wherever I want. I tend to do it where I move the smaller number, that way the answer is positive. Uh, the end goal is for me to have a positive coefficient or the number in front. If I subtract 3x from both sides here, I will do that. 5x minus 3x becomes 2x. So at the same time, I'm going to add 10 to both sides. And I get 34. When I solve for x, divide by 2, I get x equals 17. Does this work? Does it satisfy everything? We can plug it in and verify. 17 minus 2 over 17 plus 8 
Does that equal three fifths? The top I get 15, the bottom I get 25. And this is three times five over five times five. So the fives cancel and I'm left with three, three over five. So yes, it does. If you have an X on bottom, always check to make sure your answer doesn't make the bottom of zeros. <clears throat> and by checking our work here we actually did the bottom here was 17 plus 8 is 25 that's definitely not zero so we didn't break the, the system One more for you. This isn't in the same form, is it? I don't have the proportions, but any whole number, I can make a fraction if I just say divided by one. And then I can make it fit the proportion idea. I do this here. We get three times one is three, seven times x. If I divide by x or seven, I get x. So three sevens equals x. What would make the bottom here zero? If the bottom, if I, if I want this, if I don't want this bottom to zero, this is the only value to it. You can just set it equal to zero and figure out what it is. X equals zero is bad juju. It's a number we can't have. We didn't have that here. I could have done the same thing up above. Up above, we had X minus two over X plus eight. If you want to see what the denominator or the bottom can't be, Take the bottom and set it equal to zero. If I do that, well, not equal to zero, but you're still solving the same way. Subtract eight, we see that X cannot equal negative eight. If 
I do that here, I see that X cannot equal zero. And it doesn't, it equals three sevenths, so we're good. <clears throat> You guys ready for some more? Next chapter. Nine point one. Chapter nine is on graphing and doing some other stuff with with lines. Nine point one is graphing linear equations. and functions. So, maybe it's more useful if I use a piece of paper that already has a graph on it. <clears throat> so the way our graphing system works is we have a vertical line and a horizontal line. And the vertical line is called the y-axis. And the horizontal line is called the x-axis. And then we can have different points on this stuff. Each of these points has a coordinate. It's called an ordered pair. Ordered pairs are in the form of X, Y. Ordered pairs. The first ordered pair here, A, is at four comma two. So the way you can find it is just count how many, the center is where they meet, the, the center is called the origin. It's, it's where the both values equal zero. What we do to find a value for any point or put up any point on the graph is we count how many steps left or right. I'm too zoomed in. Oh. Count steps left or right for the X. That's part one. And then count up or down for Y. Left is negative, right is positive. Down is negative and up is positive. <clears throat> Close, it's a negative two, one. Oh, yeah. I was going to move the pencil along and show you guys, but I want to make sure you guys understood what I was doing before I started doing it. 
So to get to A, what I did is I went right one, two, three, four, and then I went up two. And that's how I got the four of the two. To get to the B, I gotta go left one, two, so I will have a negative two. And then I gotta go up one, so one. That's negative six on there. Every other second one is labeled, which is going to give me, I'll, I'll show you how to do this by hand. I think maybe let's just finish doing these points first and I'll show you how to do it without graph paper. It's easy on graph paper, uh, but you have to label everything and it, it, it can absolutely help to not do it on graph paper where you don't have all the grid lines there in some circumstances. Here, I'm going to count left to see. I got two, three, four, five. And then I'm down three. So negative five, negative three. And for D, I am right two and down two, three, four. Right two and down four. So these are called ordered pairs. They're also called points. Points. So I'll call this 9.1 at top here. You guys ready for the next part? So if you're doing it by hand, make a vertical line and make a horizontal line. I strongly recommend you at least go out five in each direction and try to space them evenly. Make the fifth hashtag little mark a little bit bigger. And try to keep them evenly spaced. And make more hashtags or marks as you need them. Then you can label every fifth one as five and it kind of helps you jump around faster. This is negative five here, this is negative five there. Up and right are both positive five. So let's look at plotting some points. Let's do two, four, negative four, one, zero, five, four, zero, negative one, negative three, negative three, negative one, no, fuck it, negative three, zero, and then zero, negative two. Like really being able to know where these things go on the graph is like half the fucking go. If you don't know how the graph works, it's, it's entire sections just gonna suck and the graphs will never make sense to you. But if you can work through this and get an understanding of the, how the, the mapping system works,
Maybe I'll give you these letters so that when we put them on there, I can label them. For A, I want to go right to and up four. Remember, this is my X, the left or right, and Y is up or down. So I'm going to go right to and then up four, and that will be point A. B is at negative four, one, so negative four is... The first number is left or right. Left is for negatives. I go left four. Up one puts me right there. That's B. For C, I have zero five, which means I go left or right zero. I don't go left or right. I just go up or down. And I go up five, puts me right there. That's C. So when one of the numbers is zero, you are on one of these axes. For four zero, I go right four, and then I go up or down zero. I don't shift past there. So that's my D. <clears throat> Negative one, negative three, I go left one for the negative one. I go down three to get to negative three. That's my E. Let's make this positive three and negative one right there for F. Three right three down one. That's F. If I do negative three zero, I go left three and I don't go up or down. That's my G. And for zero or negative two, I don't go left or right zero, but I go down two. That'll be H. <laughs> these axes, these they break up the quad this into four different quadrants. There are four quadrants. And we generally call them Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4 in Roman numerals. You don't have to use Roman numerals. Uh, you don't want to. It starts up here. Q1 is the upper right one. And then we go counterclockwise. We go backwards. Q2 is over here. Q3 is down here. Quadrant three. And quadrant four is over here. Quadrant one, X and Y are always positive. X is a positive number, Y is a positive number. Every single value up in this region up here, quadrant one, has two positive numbers. Quadrant two, my X value is negative and my Y value is positive. That holds true for everything in quadrant two. Quadrant three, they're both negatives.
And in quadrant four, X is positive, but Y is negative. That's just working on our, our unit system. This is the, it's called the rectangular coordinate system. It's also called Cartesian coordinate system. Or some fun Jeopardy facts for you when you're watching Jeopardy with Grandma. Your uncle. I love Little Fortune. My wife won't let me watch Little Fortune with her because I'm too fucking good at it. I, at one time, I got a puzzle with no fucking letters shown. It was like one of the weird categories, like place or something. And it had like, it had the right number, like right spacing of letters. And I just, each word has a certain length. And I was going off the lengths of the words and I just fucking guessed it right off the gate. And when it was the right answer, she was fucking pissed. She already gets mad when I get the answer with like one or two letters just showing. But what I got was zero, you know, she was mad as mad as hell. In what? Oh, okay. All right. So how does this fall into our linear stuff there, our lines that we're doing? So when we have something uh with equations with just an x and a y to the first power are linear equations and they make lines In math, lines are straight. If a line is not straight, it's called a curve. Curves are not straight. the hell is going on now? You're just, this, there's nothing funny going on. Is that what it is? Yes. You got me all paranoid, like I got a fucking hole in my crotch or fucking on my, something on my pants or something. Now I'm all fucking self-conscious. Self You're fucking with me. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, a common way we wanted to show, uh, usually, and we'll see this more later on, we want to end up with a dependent variable, which is y, equals the independent variable, which is x, independent variable term, I should say, plus some constant. And this will be a number. I should say constant. For example, y equals 2x minus 3. Linear equations make things called functions. Functions are 
uh, relationships between a dependent and independent variable, between two variables. We usually write them as f of x, and they equal the y term. So this right here is a linear equation. If I replace the y with an f of x, this is a linear function. This is read as f of x. It is not multiplied. And what we're doing with it, this is my input and this is my output. So it's like, I could drop a value in the machine and it spits out a value. By dropping in an X coordinate, it spits out a Y coordinate. Replace X with the value. And F of X produces the Y value. Look at a couple of examples. We're going to use that 2x minus 3 and practice graphing it. We'll do another one. So until we learn some more skills, this, this next thing we're doing works all the time, no matter what, without fail. We can make a table of x and y values. I'm going to use the f of x. Some handy things to do is just put in values that are near zero. Maybe start with zero in the middle and go back one or two and forward one or two. <laughs> for this one, what I do for the function is I replace the x with a negative 2. I say x equals negative 2. And where it shows up in the equation, I replace the x with that value. Two times negative 2 is negative 4. And negative 4 minus 3 is negative 7. So f of negative 2 equals negative 7. What we were just doing in our graphing says put a point at negative 2, negative 7. That's how these two connect to the graphing idea. We can do that for each of these. F of negative one is two times negative one minus three, which is negative five.
f of x equals zero. It's two times zero minus three is negative three. If I do the remaining ones, we get negative one, and I get positive one. So these are my five points I can put on a graph. So if I go putting them in, and assuming that if you have graph paper, this looks a little bit better. These will definitely look like a straight line in graph paper. Here it looks a little bent. That line right there, if we connect the dots with the straight line, that is y equals 2x minus 3, or f of x equals 2x minus 3. <clears throat> Any questions on that so far? It's not the most exciting thing, I know. Do another one, we'll call this problem B. Uh, 2x plus y equals 7. This is a lot easier if you solve for y. So I'm going to subtract 2x from both sides. And you get y equals negative 2x plus 7, or f of x equals negative 2x plus 7. And I can make my table. Maybe if you only want to do a couple, if you put in 2, 0, and negative, uh, negative 2, 0, and positive 2. You should always do at least three. Two. It only takes two points to draw a straight line, but the third one will make sure you didn't fuck up because they all have to stay on the same, same line. So I will plug this stuff in f of negative two. And two times negative two is positive four. So this gets me 11. I've got negative 2 comma 11 for one of the points. Get the point zero 07 here. And by sticking to here, I got negative two times two is negative four plus seven is positive three. So I've got two, three.
looks like I don't have very many negative values. So I'm going to make my graph a little bit longer in the positive directions. So negative two, 11, I go back to and I go up 11. This would be 10, I go up one more and I'm right there. Zero, seven, I go up to the five and then two more puts me right there. And two, three is right there. I connect these dots, they make a straight line. Hmm? What's your question be? Um, how, how do you give the value to X? How do you know what value is going to be to X? Because of the minus two X? Uh, this is the equation that we had solving from here. <clears throat> and I'm literally just plugging the negative two in for the X's. I'm replacing the X with the value. And I just chose these values. I could have said negative one. I, I was picking values around x equals zero, to be honest. Uh, I could have went with negative one, zero, and one rather than negative two, zero, and two. So unless it specifies, just pick easy values to work with. Uh, the only reason I didn't do negative one, zero, and one was to illustrate you do not stop doing every single step. You don't have to do one apart for everything on x. You can do more than one part. Uh, does that answer your question? Like how you were asking where, where I got the, okay, yeah. Yeah, I'm just randomly picked to be near zero and not one away is really what I was doing. So this is the y equals negative two x plus seven or f of x equals negative two x plus seven. There are advantages to the linear answer uh, or the function answer. This point right here is f of two equals three in the linear function. It actually it tells me what my x value and my y value are, in, are right in it. If you just do the same with this equation up here, you kind of lose the x value. You just get to the y value. <laughs> The two X plus Y equals seven that I started with. This is called the standard form of an equation. It generally goes along the lines of AX plus BY equals C. We'll dive more into that in the next couple of days. A can equal zero, oops, sorry. A can equal zero, or B can equal zero, can, but not both. You don't want both of them to go away. Those are the numbers in front of the X's and Y's. So you can have equations with just an X and no equations with just a Y, and on um, Wednesday we'll look at graphing some of those. I can check to see if values work without looking at the graph or looking at the graph. For two X plus Y equals seven, uh, let's see if negative one, 10 is on the graph. Let's check negative one and 10 and then maybe, maybe check uh, one and five. So are these on the graph? Negative 110, I can see, is not on the graph. 15 looks like it's on the graph, but that's not really the best way to check it. Plug them into the equation. So if I want to check these in the equation, uh, 
I'm going to check negative 110. I'm just going to replace my x with negative 1 and my y is with 10. Does that equal 7? And on the left side, I get 8 equals 7. 8 does not equal 7. So negative 110 is not a solution. To 2x plus y equals 7. Mm -hmm. We're almost done. We check one five. Is that equal seven? There, I guess seven equals seven. So yes, one five is a solution to two x plus y equals seven. It's on the line. Generally, that's not how we get these types of problems in reality. So maybe let's just look at a problem that we can get in reality and set up an equation for it. You want to need this up longer before I start yanking it? Nope. That's not great. Okay. Uh, so let's say uh, we're at the library upstairs and we're making copies. Let's assume they have a color copy or two. I don't know if they do. Uh, and you make 15 black and white copies and seven color copies. And they cost you Some information I don't have here would be like the price of each copy. The black and white price, I don't know what that equals. The color copy, I don't know what that equals. The color price. So when I don't know when something, what something is, I can give it a value or a variable. I can call it B. I can call this C. So with that information, I know that if I make, if this is the price for one copy, this is like one copy, let's say B equals five cents. If I had two B, that's 10 cents. Three B is 15 cents. How many of many copies I make, it's a nickel for each one. Here, I don't know how many or how much B is, though. I don't know how much B is, but I do know I made 15 copies. So the price of the black and whites is 15 B. Similarly, I can do 7C for the price of my color copies. If I add these together, I'm adding the price of what I paid for black and white and the price of what I paid for color. This should give me the total cost, right? Total cost of my copies, which in this case was $8.60.
These are called mathematical models. And if we have more information, we could actually find out what B and C are, and then we could figure out what any combination of costs would equal. So if I knew, let's say I knew, if I know color copies are 80 cents, Let's find the cost for black and white. This takes us back to what we were just doing in uh, 8.1, the formula. This is a formula, really, right? This is a formula. And I know color copies are 80 cents. That was my C. So I can replace my C with 0 0.80. That's a parenthesis. <clears throat> so let's let's figure out what B is. Seven times point eight is five dollars and sixty cents. And I can subtract that five sixty. I get B equals 0 0.2. I throw that in a calculator. C was in terms of money. The right side was in terms of money. So this is money. So saying point two isn't really very good. It's black and white copies are 20 cents. Exactly. Or 0 0.20 dollars. I'll wrap up today's lecture. But you want to go a lot more? Are you sure? That would be all, Andrew, Bernardo, and Nathan. Peace.